to set the context to the book i'd like to take you through some of the historical settings uh, in uh, around the events in this book the israelites uh, were taken into babylonian exile in stages from 605 bc to uh, 586 bc the first return of jews to their homeland has happened since under the leadership of high priest joshua son of jehoshadak and zerubbabel the events and the story we are about to consider happen between the first and the second return the second return was led by ezra and the third return by nehemiah from a chronological standpoint the events in the book of esther fall between ezra chapters 6 and 7 from a persian empire point of view after the reign of king darius the great the next king ahasuerus is one of the characters of this book king ahasuerus reigned over a vast empire from 485 to 465 bc which included our nation india as well all the events recorded in this book falls in this period the book is a testament of god's care and faithfulness even when the same group of people were happy with their circumstances despite being away from god's promised land their home israel mordecai and ezra esther or their parents had the opportunity to go back to their own land but would have chosen not to this is probably because the current place that they were in gave them and the jews enough comfort and space that they felt comfortable in a foreign land events in this book fit into a normal pattern of cause and effect but woven through out are the hidden purposes of god the main hero of this book is god who works behind the scenes to accomplish his purposes and to preserve the very race through which he would unravel his grand plan of salvation for the entire humanity this book opens with a party uh and uh this book opens with a party that went on for 6 uh months we're going to be looking at uh, chapters 1 and 2 shortly while the reason uh, of uh is not given for the party my curiosity led me to stumble upon historical accounts that could possibly be true in 483 bc king ahasuerus was getting ready to fight in the battle of thermopylae against greece it was probably before this battle that he throws a party and at the end of the party he gets rid of his uh, queen vasti but as history reveals he loses the battle and in the and in 479 bc he chooses his a uh, new queen esther since we have a lot to cover we'll not be dwelling on the rest of the uh, uh, chapter 1 which elaborates the selection process in the uh, for the next queen this book uh, esther has similarities and contrasts with the historical accounts in the book of daniel as both the books uh, both these books records the historical accounts of jews in exile outside of israel while god gave daniel favor in the uh, sight of king nebuchadnezzar daniel chapter 1 was uh, daniel chapter 1 was 9 says and and god gave favor and uh, compassion in the sight of the chiefs of the eunuchs just a second however when we see that uh, esther won favor in the eyes of the officials in the king's palace and also more importantly in king ahasuerus's eyes also while De- daniel refused to take part in the king's table here we see in this book that esther identifies herself with the procedures and customs of the palace to the extent that she does not reveal her true identity in the story as esther moves into the palace to be part of the selection process naturally a question arises as to how and why was she part of the selection process knowing that the process 
is for a pagan king. There are two possibilities in my mind. Mordecai, the first possibility is that Mordecai would have asked her to be a candidate in the selection process. Now in this scenario, Mordecai probably had her safety in mind when he asked her to be a candidate for the queen's position as he was at the king's gate, which meant that he was some low level, a lower level official in the king's palace handling transactions of the common public on behalf of the king's secretary, secretariat. Esther also had, very, had to make very difficult moral choices during the selection process, as we saw earlier, and even more. Human choices are of great importance and have profound consequences, whether good or bad. But, it is, but this is exactly where we learn about God. It is God working through human choices and decisions, good or bad. He achieves his perfect goals, not through our best intentions or desires. Even through our sin and compromises, he proves to be sovereign. In this scenario, this, these Jewish characters, Mordecai and Esther, are not heroes to be emulated. In fact, they are far less than perfect, but yet the Lord uses them to accomplish his purposes for the Israelites. Dear friend, if you are ruining over or regretting a wrong choice or a decision that you've made or a sin that you've committed, let me encourage you that it's not over yet. I'm not advocating by any means for us to continue in sin, but as a sincere believer who hates sin, but yet has succumbed to decisions or desires that has had a sinful outcome, the Lord would like to encourage you to know that he is sovereign and can turn around outcomes for his glory. As we were seeing, you know, we were looking at what could have been the possibilities of this, of uh, Esther making herself available for the selection process. The second possibility that came into my mind is, uh, is that Hadasha, as Esther is known by her Jewish name, was forcibly taken where both Mordecai and Hadasha did not have a choice or it was not their decision. On a side note, I'm more inclined to think that Mordecai would have wrote this book he specifies his role in writing and executing the second order to protect the Jews. Going by this premise, it looks more like that um, Hadasha is probably taken forcibly. Else, Mordecai would have indicated that he put her in the contest instead of leaving it vague. In this scenario, we see Hadasha finds herself in a situation in which she doesn't have any say. I'm reminded of Joseph who was put in situations not a result of his choices, but handpicked by the unseen hand to fulfill greater purposes. Dear friend, are you in that situation in your life today? If yes, please be assured or reassured that the Lord is in control. First Peter 4 verse 12 and 13 says, Behold, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Coming back to the story, either ways, if she didn't become a queen, we know from Esther chapter 2 was 12 to 14 on where she could have ended up being. The verses read like this. Now when the turn came for each woman, woman to go into King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since there was the regular period of their beautifying six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. When the young woman went in to the king this way, she was given whatever she desired to take from her, uh, take with her 
from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shashgas, Shash the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. Think about this. If Esther were, was not selected as the queen, then she would have had to become one of the concubines without freedom to lead her own life with a husband of her own choice. However, we know how the Lord directed the events forward. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 1 says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. In Esther, uh, Esther chapter 2 verse 17, we see that the, uh, the king loved Esther more than all the women and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he may set the royal crown on her head and make her queen instead of Vasti. Another one other question that comes to my mind is what allowed Mordecai to continue mentoring Esther despite she being a queen now. I'd like to point three reasons for this. The first reason, as you can see, is that uh, he had a relationship with Esther. Esther was uh, Esther uh, lost her parents when she was very young and Mordecai had to take care of Esther and because of which she, he knew her for years and that relationship helped them in, uh, in, in, in uh, Mordecai continuing to mentor Esther. The second reason we see in Esther chapter 2 verse 11 is that uh, Mordecai kept on checking about the affairs of Esther while she was in the harem. It shows us that he had love and concern for Esther. The third thing that, uh, the third point is that, you know, Mordecai, when he had the, when, when there was a plot against the king's life, uh, Mordecai had the option of communicating this to anybody, but he chose to communicate this to Esther and through, uh, communicate this to the king through Esther. That shows that he has confidence in Esther. We move on to the next uh, four chapters, chapter three to seven. After mentioning about the heroics of Mordecai at the end of chapter two, we see a twist in the smooth progress in events we witnessed till now. The villain of the story is introduced in the person of Haman. Esther chapter three was one and two. King Ahasuerus promoted Haman to be the prime minister of the kingdom. Mordecai does not bow before Haman. We generally know that Mordecai spent his time at the king's gate, which for logical reasons, let us assume that he would have had to uh, bow each time the king came in and went out. I don't think it, this was an intentional disrespect to the position that the king bestowed upon Haman. And I don't also think that, in, that uh, Mordecai had any reluctance uh, to bow because of the Jewish uh, you know, uh, law which said that, or, or the commandment that uh, God gave to Moses that you should not bow before any, uh, before any other gods or before anybody. But that's not the case here. I don't think uh, uh, there is a bit of history we have to know in order to understand why Mordecai had an issue to bow before Haman. The little we know about Haman is that he was an Agagite. First Samuel chapter 15 was two and three in, 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 in uh, first Samuel chapter 15 was two and three. We see that the Lord had commanded Saul through Samuel to destroy the Amalekites. However, we know that Saul spared the life of King Agag whom later Samuel had to kill. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 17 to 19 gives us an insight into this enmity be between the Amalekites and the Israelites. It reads, remember what Amalek 
did to you on the way you as you came out of egypt how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail those who were lagging behind you and he did not fear god therefore when the lord your god has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the lord your god is giving you for an inheritance to possess you shall blot out the memory of amalek from under heaven you shall not forget it is in this context that mordecai refused to bow before haman bowing before a person is to show respect on the other hand who is mordecai he is most likely a descendant of kish the father of king saul so when saul disobeyed and refused to destroy the amalekites a route was left which brings us to the new threat the jews are now facing as the chapter 6 as the chapter 3 was 6 says he refused uh, that is uh, haman refused to settle scores with mordecai instead he had his eyes on the entire race of mordecai the jews this gives us a picture of the eternal enmity between the serpent and the seed of the woman earlier we saw how the palace gave us a picture of the world and here we see haman the enemy of the jews the second in command as a person calling the shots and influencing the king in the wrong direction is this something we can relate to in our present day and age do we see the threat the ruler of this world pose on god's children there is nothing to fear sam 91 to uh, 91 was 1 to 10 tells us the attitude we ought to have and the attitude mordecai demonstrated mordecai was full had full confidence in the god he believed verse 4 says he will cover you with his pinions or feathers and under his wings you will find refuge his faithfulness is a shield and buckler john chapter 12 31 to 32 uh, you don't need to turn there it's there on your screen gives us the hope and the confidence to have this attitude in the face of the threat in front of us through christ's victory over satan we are assured of our victory while it is only mordecai who refused to bow before haman evil haman harbored hate against the entire jewish race as we discussed earlier he now successfully gets a decree signed by the king to move forward with his plan to wipe out the jews from the face of the earth haman goes on to pay for the expenditure to carry out this massacre one of its kind probably fiercer than the nazis resolute plan to destroy the jews in more recent history interestingly queen esther does not get to know about this till her servants or attendants tell her in chapter 4 verse 4 the decree went out of the very palace in which she resided as a queen isn't this our story too that in the comfort that the world offers we often miss to perceive the very threat to our lives from the enemy what are we worried about today our job security a bank balance flamboyant lifestyle have the cares of this world carried us far away from the pain and the hardships our fellow brethren face elsewhere for the sake of the gospel are we insensitive to the imminent threat that's looming large over our brethren and even on our own selves queen hester who concealed her identity does not know about the threat to her own life simply because the people around her did not know who she really is she concealed her real name hadasha as well as her identity albeit at the instance of her uncle mordecai but we see how 
gracious our God is in making her to be the mediator for her people. Here we see the grand plan of God unfold so beautifully. We see how God had prepared a person of influence in the very palace of the king who decreed the annihilation or the destruction. When the decree or the order reached all the provinces, the Jews all over mourned with fasting and weeping and lamenting in sackcloth and ashes, as we see in chapter 4, verse 3. When Mordecai asked Esther to speak to the king to save the Jews, Queen Esther initially showed her reluctance to follow Mordecai's command. The woman who obeyed Mordecai without questions till now is now reluctant to obey her mentor. We, she saw the physical threat that loomed over her own life, but she couldn't for a moment see the threat that was over the entire Jewish race. We see how her concealed identity is now becoming a huge threat to her own life. In Esther chapter 4, verse 13 to 16, not only did Mordecai see the big picture, he also had faith in the promise God made to Abraham that he will make Abraham a great nation. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Esther had a choice to make whether to come out of her concealed identity with the huge risk of losing her own life or to stay within that concealment. She now understands the reality and how far she was from it. Esther was almost certain of her death. In that verse, we see that she mentions that if I perish, I perish. But yet she was willing to be identified with her people, God's chosen. We see the likes of Moses and Joseph who similarly make unique choices in order to stand in the gap for their brethren. Are we willing to identify ourselves with our brethren and stand as praying saints or use our position, knowledge, power in order to protect or ask for protection for God's people? Esther asked Mordecai and all the Jews in Susa to fast for three days. Verse 17 says, Mordecai did everything as Esther had ordered him. Mordecai willingly obeyed his cousin whom he had brought up as his own daughter. In, in chapters five and six, Esther goes to meet the king despite the risk to her own life. Though it is against the law, as we, see in, as we see in the previous chapter, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 2 says she won favor in his sight and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Esther goes on to plan a banquet for the king and Haman in order to reveal the plot planned by Haman. We see God, how God gives wisdom to Queen Esther and thereby rolling out his plan of action. In these two chapters, chapter five and six, we see we, it reveals us the sleeplessness of two different people for two different purposes. Haman couldn't sleep as he was busy preparing the blueprint and even executing it to hang Mordecai even before the end of the 12 months as per the original decree. On the same night as we read in chapter 6, verse 1, the king couldn't sleep too. The king would, could not sleep for a reason. He, but what surprises me is that he asked for the most unusual book, a history book, to be read to him at the most unusual time. In fact, I was awake too at 2 a.m. in the night preparing this message, but that's just a coincidence. The king decides to honor Mordecai for uncovering the plot to assassinate the king in chapter 2, verse 21 to 23. In Psalm 4, verse 8, we read like this, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Most likely, Mordecai might have slept very well that night, knowing by faith 
that relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from the Lord. God works in unusual ways. Here's a song William Cowper wrote, and it goes like this. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footstep in the sea and rides upon the storm, deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweeter will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Was it a coincidence that Haman was in the palace court in the night wanting to speak to the king? Certainly not. God has a sense of humor. While Haman is harboring hatred toward Mordecai, the Lord moves the king's heart in favor of Mordecai. The honor the king desires to bestow is felt by none other than the, the person harboring the hate. Haman is so proud, blinded by pride that he thought who else is worthy of the king's honor except him. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Imagine the humiliation that Haman went through when he had to parade Mordecai, his worst enemy, through the city in order to fulfill the king's order to honor Mordecai. The fall was written all over. Haman was never... Uh, Haman never saw it coming. The ultimate victory belongs to the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 24 to 26 says, Then comes the end when he, Jesus Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Even Haman's wife and friends who helped him plan the plot to kill Mordecai knew that Haman will fall before Mordecai. In chapter 7, Queen Esther reveals Haman's plot and the king is furious and orders that Haman be hanged. In Esther chapter 7, verse Three and four, we see Esther identifying herself with God's people. God's work through Esther had just begun. Now the enemy of God's people, now the enemy of God's people, Haman, is hanged in the very gallows he prepared for Mordecai. In Esther, we see a mediator who put her own life at the risk to rescue her people. It so much reminds me of Christ's work on the cross of Calvary to defeat the foes of darkness. The next and the last portion that we will be considering is chapters 8 to 10, which I've titled as The Rescue. Esther gets Mordecai into the palace as there is, much, uh, there is a much larger issue. The first order passed by the king under the direction of Haman cannot be revoked. This tells me about another order that is passed that cannot be revoked. The order that the wages of sin is death. There's got to be another order for the defense of the Jews. Esther not only identifies herself with her people, but she throws herself at the feet of the king to plead on behalf of her people. Chapter 8 verse 5 says, 
if I have found favor in his sight, if I am pleasing in his eyes. Verse 6 says, how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? We see a beautiful partnership between Esther and Mordecai. While Esther persuades the king, Mordecai draws up the draft for the second order. Three months after the first order, the second order goes under the careful direction of Mordecai, the newly declared prime minister. Chapter 9, verse 4 says, Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew much, grew more and more powerful. This reminds me of David who replaced Saul and First Chronicles chapter 11 verse 9 says that David, he grew greater and greater for the Lord of hosts was with him. Surely the Lord of hosts is with Mordecai. The second order empowered the Jews to accomplish what Saul left behind in 1 Samuel chapter 15. The new order says the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend themselves, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children or women, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. Please note, to plunder their goods. On the same day as that of the first order, but on that day, we see that the Jews struck all the enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. 9 verse 5. This is this time, though, as we read in chapter 9, verse uh, 10, uh, 15, and 16, we see that the Jews laid no hands on the plunder. There was gladness and rejoicing among the Jews all over. The ones who sought to destroy God's people were finally destroyed. Those who planned evil against God's chosen will not prevail. Your hand will, not, will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from among the children of men. Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. Psalm 21, 8, 10, and 11. Let me conclude now. Esther needed a Mordecai to draw up a plan and execute it. But when, we, when our Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam came down into this world to fulfill the second order that with the shedding of blood there is remission for sin he did not need a Mordecai to help him for he himself was the beginning and the end. He is before all things and in him all things are held together. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 The kingdom of Ahasuerus provides a stark contrast to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of the world demands that we follow its evil ways when we accept to be uh, evil ways. When, it, when we accept to be part of the kingdom of God, we come under a wise king, the one who does not need anybody's counsel, unlike King Ahasuerus who had to rely on his wise men. Haman, and then later on, Mordecai. There's going to be a day when the whole world will bow before this righteous king, our God. The feast we'll have in his kingdom will be greater than, the, than that which was served in the kingdom of Ahasuerus. While the feast of the king Ahasuerus was limited to six months, the feast we'll be part of in the kingdom of God will be for eternity. In King Ahasuerus, we see a self-centered king who banished his bride on a drunken whim. But we, the church, 
will be the bride of the selfless servant king who laid down his life in order to redeem his bride. Our king is not like King Ahasuerus who would ignore his bride and be unfaithful to her. But our bride, King Jesus, loves us and makes us beautiful not by pampering but by pruning. Not by demanding us to soak in oil and spices but by encouraging us to soak in the word of God. Not by living in secluded luxury but by entering into the suffering in the world around us. Our king was marred for our transgressions and was made as one whose visage was so marred beyond human semblance that men would hide their face. So that we who were marred with sin would be made beautiful. In his kingdom, we have a better mediator than Esther. Our mediator knew our condition very well and was not concerned of preserving his own life. In fact, he came into this world on his own to give himself up. He didn't need to be persuaded by a Mordecai but instead decided to intercede for us before the foundation of the world. He didn't risk his life like Esther did. Instead, he willingly paid the cost of our redemption. Because the fierce rod of judgment fell upon him, God could extend the golden scepter of his favor toward us. We need not fear to approach before his holy and awesome throne but instead we are encouraged to come boldly before the throne with confidence, knowing that we are always welcome. We are born into a kingdom under an irrevocable decree that threatens our life. But our king has issued another decree that will be our salvation, which is but the free gift of God, his eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Brethren, the pulls and the flesh pulls of the pleasures of the kingdom of the world is strong. This world wants us to identify with itself. It wants us to think and speak like its inhabitants. Remember, the Jews were not in their homeland. They didn't want to go back. But the kingdom of God calls us to identify ourselves with its inhabitants, who has the character of its righteous king. This would mean that we would have to lose our identity in this world. We would suffer injustice, be hated and voiceless. But brethren, don't lose heart for the kingdom of God is at hand. There will be a great reversal of fortunes. Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 21 verse 12 to 19, but before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to mediate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you, they will put to death. You will be hated by or for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, he will, you will gain your lives. Dear friend, this morning, who do you want to identify yourself with? I know I may be speaking to believers as well as unbelievers. If you haven't known Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I'm afraid I have to tell you that you are in the kingdom of this world 
which is all about wickedness. But if you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then let me assure you that this world is not your home. There is a home that we all have to go. May this word be an encouragement to all of us. God bless.